presentation and uh, we please tweet and uh, share your messages of the topics presented on the social media. It's my honor to introduce the, my co-chair, Marios. Good morning, warm welcome uh, from my side. My name is Marius Georgiou, I'm co-chairing with uh, Primoz and uh, I'm glad to uh, introduce uh, the first speaker, which uh, is Professor uh, Bill. Um, professor Bill is um, a professor of uh, intensive care and uh, uh, works in St. Uh, Thomas's Hospital, and he has done a lot of work in, uh, in monitoring and informatics. Professor Bill. Thank you very much. So, hopefully, we will see something in a moment. So this definitely worked a moment okay. ago. Ah, there we are. So I can't actually see any of you, which is slightly disconcerting. Um, but thank you very much for the kind invitation. And uh, in the next um, half an hour or so, um, I want to um, just go through with you uh, some thoughts around our own experience of using sensor technologies um, uh, to try and look at this element, uh, issue of uh, patient deterioration. And just a few acknowledgements. Uh, I do a little bit of consulting, not really in this area, but uh, more in um, uh, a general sort of monitoring informatics sense with Philips Healthcare with payment going to my institution. I don't know what's happening to this. Why is it with a slightly loose connection? Um, go backwards, sorry. Back to the acknowledgements. And um, much of what I'm going to show you uh, in terms of the sp specific work, whoops, is, um, is part of um, something that was called the Hospital of the Future program, which was a, a, uh, a grant fun funded by the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences um, Council. I'm not quite sure why this is bouncing around. And um, forms part of the uh, PhD work of two of our students, Dr. Tim Bonici and uh, Dr. Peter Charlton. Okay, so we've always uh, monitored patients who are sick and about whom we are concerned and um, use various sensors and monitoring devices to achieve this. But of course our hospital landscape has changed. Um, I think there's a cable problem here. Um, and we have fewer beds and sicker patients. And so our emphasis on um, patient uh, and looking at patients and trying to uh, make sure that they don't deteriorate is very important. Usually this works extremely well, but maybe not today. Anyway, we'll, do, we'll crack on and see if we can manage. Um, and you often see this sort of thing, the technology revolution schema like this, which I hope stays on the stream long enough to work, because it, it, this sort of sci-fi imagery is, um, is quite interesting. Um, no sensors visible and all the rest of it. But even this, I would, uh, I would um, challenge because if you, uh, if you look at um, this sort of area, well, you can't because it's disappeared again off the screen. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Um, then um, you can see at the back of the screen there projected on the wall, something that looks very much like conventional monitoring. And actually, I think that uh, one of the weaknesses with this sort of imagining the future is that displaying information in that way and using it that way is not uh, likely to be what we do in the future. That's really just a fancy reproduction of some sort of oscilloscope. And we'll be presenting and using data much more intelligently than that. Now another key driver in, uh, in this whole area is, is this general one of um, 
of cost and um, the fact that healthcare as an industry, as you can see on this slide, has had no productivity growth at all. Health and social care is the second band on that graph. And you can see that uh, it's the one industry, if you like, in the United States, but it's true in all healthcare environments in the first world, where there's been no uh, improvement in productivity. So we look to technology to try and help us with this burden of uh, ever-increasing health demand. And of course, we have already simplified uh, and widely used surveillance approaches. And this is the widely used telemedicine approach uh, that covers about 14% of beds in the, UK, in the US these days. Um, and that, although it uses conventional sensors, does try and bring together an overview of a patient population with monitoring and various alerting tools to guide uh, carers who are providing oversight to be able to have some sort of uh, ability to focus their efforts in wherever it's most needed. Now, in any sort of new approach, there are a number of assumptions at play. Um, and in fact, our uh, widespread use of early warning scores and medical response teams has already started us on this journey. Hopefully, I can get these slides up long enough for you to see them. Um, and the rise of electronic record keeping clearly makes this easier um, because more frequent or even continuous monitoring may make it easier to um, uh, spot deterioration. That tends to be the assumption we make when we get into this world of thinking about wearables and other monitoring techniques. Um, and of course, wearable technology makes it possible to monitor more patients and in a wider range of environments. So uh, everyone is very interested in it. And of course, we hope that that allied to sophisticated data analysis, which is the subject of one of the later talks, will predict deterioration, focus resources, and all the rest. Now, um, it's important to think, though, about the process that's involved here um, when you look at conventionally how you might intervene. Because you have a number of steps in the journey from the patient, the um, uh, recording of vital signs, assessing, escalation, treatments, and outcomes. And each of those uh, is complicated in its own right. So I just want to focus on two elements of this, um, which uh, are what is required to deliver reliable continuous monitoring and is continuous monitoring helpful? Now people, this statement in fact comes from a consensus about uh, um, medical alert teams that if practical and affordable, all patients should be monitored continuously. And maybe that's true. And you can certainly imagine that that's where we'll get to, um, particularly when it becomes uh, easy to do this in a reliable and sustainable fashion. But there are two, I suppose, elements, more than two, but at least two elements of the technology challenge there. One, of course, are the devices themselves. But if you're going to monitor with sensors at scale, then um, you also have to monitor your sensor suite. You have to know that sensor 12 on ward 3 at bed 9 on Mrs. Bloggs is going to run out of battery uh, and its polling rate is going down and all the rest of it. And you have to have an ability to replace that and manage that. So there's a, at scale, there's a requirement, a set of challenges around monitoring the monitors, the sensors, as well as monitoring the patients. But nevertheless, you can imagine that continuous monitoring is going to be very effective and easy and simple for some, in, for some indications. For instance, this one um, where uh, it picks up the switch to atrial fibrillation. And of course, the, um, a number of consumer health applications now, including the, uh, the latest version of the Apple uh, Watch, have this sort of monitoring within them with the belief that if this is picked up and, uh, and detected uh, in the community, then of course, it becomes a powerful tool potentially for intervening and reducing the risk of stroke and other cardiac events. So there are clearly some places where this sort of thing is already gaining considerable traction. Now, 
wearable monitoring has been around a long time, and as you can see here, it, uh, it evolves um, from being highly complicated and, and uh, unwieldy into the various devices that we're continuing to see emerge today. And you can divide these sorts of these monitors up in the way that uh, this schema does. Um, from the halter monitors that we've been familiar with uh, in cardiology on the wards, um, right the way through to various forms of advanced telemetry. But the important thing to note about this is that the more complicated it is to put more steps into the data acquisition pathway, then the more challenging it is to put this sort of thing in and run it at scale and make it sustainable and make it affordable. Now, um, this isn't, I don't think, anymore a completely um, uh, comprehensive list of the various uh, monitor sensors that are out there, but it's just to make the point, really, that there are quite a lot of them. It's evolving all the time, and their capabilities are changing. But the, the key limits, of course, with all of these devices is, firstly, the fact that they have to be powered. Um, and so it's a question of battery and what you're asking the sensor to do over this time period. Are you providing continuous data, semi-continuous data, intermittent data, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and how is it transmitted? Is it, is it high fidelity? Is it not? What are the sensors, the particular physiological signals that are being built into them, and how important are they? And at the moment, much of what's done is still based on the idea of uh, one or a small number of core physiological signals, whereas, of course, there's enormous potential for fusing these in various incre increasingly intelligent ways. Um, uh, much as was pioneered by my co-investigator on what I'm going to show you, Lionel Tarasenko from Oxford, who, of course, developed his Vicentia Fusion Index in that uh, general area. And so um, he uh, at Oxford University and uh, ourselves at King's College London were um, part of something called Hospital of the Future, which was a grant that uh, had the overall aim of trying to develop um, novel patient monitoring system based around wearables and a data fusion algorithm. And um, when we started out, we thought that that was an eminently achievable thing to do. And it was interesting how much more difficult uh, than we had thought it turned out to be, even though Lionel and his group in Oxford had already developed their Vicentia Fusion Index, um, which for those who aren't familiar was a, a, a mathematical um, sensor fusion uh, technology that they originally developed for aero engines with Rolls-Royce and then transferred into the healthcare environment and then subsequently made some attempt to commercialize. So um, based on that and based on what was out there and wearables, uh, we came to the conclusion that these two sensors that we would be able to use reliably, we thought, for continuous monitoring were the ECG and the PPG, the pulse oximeter and that we would be able to derive the respiratory wave uh, and respiratory rate from either or both of those signals, um, which indeed we could, and developed a number of novel algorithms to do that, although that's the subject of a separate discussion. There were also then the implementation requirements, because we wanted to be able to use whatever we did in a, an award-based environment, and therefore we couldn't um, install large numbers of extra wireless access points and all the rest of it, and there was the question of the available monitors or sensors at that time, which was about five years ago when we started this, which monitor should we use? And interestingly, there was nothing on the market that actually fully met our criteria at the time. Um, we also spent some time building a, a specific uh, smartphone app. But in the end, we came up with four uh, different sensor setups, um, and uh, these are the sort of things, they were all much the same. There was the Angel, um, there was the DynaVision, the Sensium, and the Equivital. But they're all essentially um, respiratory, well, ECG and uh, pulse oximetry plus or minus respiratory rate uh, packages, sending those signals um, with waveforms 
to a data collection system. And the first thing we needed to do um, narrowly with regard to this particular uh, issue was do some feasibility testing. So we, we aimed to look at 48 patients, 12 per system, um, and allocate them to where these systems for 24 uh, um, hours or so and uh, just get a sense of how well they worked. And interestingly, we looked at uh, more than 350 patients to try and do this to get our groups. And um, the first one that was interesting is that the one of the systems we chose just didn't work at all. But what this told us was that when you looked at the ones that were working, was that the overall data capture rate was remarkably low. You can see, um, in spite of the weakness of these flashing slides, you should be able to see at the top there that the median data capture rate was really much lower than you might think. Um, and that, of course, gives you a problem if you want to use these things and you want to uh, capture the waveforms and if you want to derive the respiratory rate, which is what we were trying to do. And if you want to upscale this and do it in a clinical trial environment. And of course, there are many causes of data loss. There can be configuration errors around the, uh, the equipment itself and the way the various um, components of the wireless system talk to each other. There can be failure to detect error in a timely fashion because it, depending how the system's set up, if it's not sending data and you don't know about it until you come to an offline analysis, then you've lost your subject. And of course, that would be even more problematic if you were using it in real life. Um, and uh, fixing errors and so forth. And part of the problem was some of these systems were relatively early in their developmental life. There's a whole nother issue, which I don't have time to go into, about acceptability and human factors and patients' willingness to wear these things, the comfort and so forth. One very interesting thing that we did note was that exactly the same sensor package might be acceptable in a post-operative surgical environment with a slightly bored, but essentially well patient wanting something to do and very interested in their own recovery, whereas the same uh, sensor package might be intolerable in a somewhat confused, elderly, acutely unwell patient in a busy medical admission ward. And of course, there's the question of what the nursing workload was. And then battery life was a problem. So in the end, to try and uh, push things forward at scale, we needed to revert to an older system uh, and a more conventional system and moving away from some of the um, uh, trendier um, sensors that were out there. So in the end, we chose this, which is the Philips telemetry system, well-established, widely used in cardiology and cardiac surgical environments, uh, um, and up spec to take the pulse oximetry component. And this was then something we could use within our existing cardiological and cardiac surgical environments because they were already equipped with this technology. Um, but it was interesting that um, at the time when we had to commit to trying to run a clinical study of some 300 patients, at least that was the target, then um, none of the technologies we had explored in the first instance were good enough to do the job. So we then proceeded to look at what turned out to be 195 cardiac surgical patients. And the way this worked was that they were... Um, they were consented, of course, they were having planned surgery. They were um, followed from th right through the post-operative journey. So while they were in the uh, intensive care environment and the post-operative um, high dependency facilities and were connected to tethered monitoring, then all their um, waveform data was collected automatically into a data acquisition system along with their electronic charting data. When they then transitioned out of that environment, and this is the bit that's the focus of what I'm going to show you today, they then moved on to this telemetry system, um, which as I say, is widely used, is reliable, is well understood in that environment. And then after that, they, um, um, and overlapping with uh, intermittent monitoring, they had um, various intermittent spot check monitoring done, and all that was acquired electronically as well, and all went into a database. Now, you can see when the slide is there that the median length of stay was about four to five days, um, and that 62% of our patients managed to wear the telemetry the whole 
period uh, while they were in the, 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 the appropriate recovery phase. Um, but again, the data capture rate was still relatively low, even for this extremely established and robust technology that didn't have the limitations associated with some of the new sensors that we initially started to try and study. And you can see at the bottom there that the ECG was around 50% and the, um, the, the pulse oximeter was lower. Now, of course, we, we, we know pulse oximeters can be a bit temperamental. But interestingly, in our earlier developmental work in the broader project, for a period of time, it had seemed as if pulse oximetry was more reliable, particularly when we were trying to do respiratory rate calculations. But in reality, that turned out not to be true. And you can see uh, here's the data capture performance represented graphically with uh, um, uh, the uh, percentage uh, on, the, on the vertical axis, the days on the bottom, and the, the top line represents the um, ECG and low on the pulse oximeter. And of course, there are many ways in which um, this can fail. Um, and you can see just some of those points illustrated on this diagram. Because in fact, what we're talking about is a highly complex uh, set of uh, interactions. And this again is just another illustration of the difference in robustness, if you like, of those two well-known physiological signals. And so when it comes to failure, there are really quite a lot of factors. Again, you have to factor in uh, usability, um, acceptability, component reliability, measurement validity. And you can see that the top of the pyramid are the ones that are in many respects easiest to deal with. Um, you can't do all that much about problems with measurement validity if, uh, if what you're doing just isn't valid. Uh, and then, of course, you've got environmental factors and users. And that isn't to be underestimated. If you're expecting something like this to be done, uh, even with a commercially available, well-established system in an environment where the nursing staff are used to it, it still required quite a lot of uh, nurse maiding, if you like, hand-holding by the research team. Um, so to do this at scale is potentially challenging. Now, in terms of what I want to show you today, we, um, during this period of monitoring with the continuous um, wearable system, we just wanted to, to look at abnormality um, as narrowly defined for heart rate and um, uh, saturation using the news, uh, news uh, definition. So we regard it as a sustained news two or worse as a deterioration in order to understand whether or not we could pick up deterioration sensibly uh, just using these two signals. There's a lot more work going on in the background about combining things, building in respiratory rate and all the rest of it, but for the purpose of today, we were looking at these two basic approaches because after all, that's what a lot of the wearable sensors do. Uh, a lot of them don't use sophisticated data fusion. Um, and are badged as if this is a, a an intuitively and obviously easy and valuable thing to do. And this graph, uh, when it's on the screen, just shows you um, on the top, um, you see heart rate uh, plotted as intermittent monitoring um, uh, and the news beneath it. And then uh, below, you see heart rate as continuous monitoring and the news uh, plotted accordingly. And they're not that different, but uh, there are some differences. And so it's interesting to understand how that would play out into the, into the clinical environment. Now, I hope this stays up long enough for me to be able to talk you through it, because this is a sensitivity analysis um, of um, what happened with these various signals. So if we start uh, on the left-hand side, um, if the patient um, goes down, then the patient, that's the patient's vital signs are stable and normal. And what we see there, um, and then that can diverge. There could be no alert or there could be an alert. And clearly, if the patient star signs are stable and there is an alert, you can characterize that as a waste of nursing time. 
if there's no alert in the stable patient, then there's no effect on uh, the nursing workload, and this is a neutral outcome. Um, if you then take the, uh, the next uh, line up, this is uh, patient vital signs are stable or recovering, and the alerts may be disabled, and that's a neutral uh, event. If you then go up to the first node going up, then we sit to see a situation where the patient's vital signs are deteriorating. And here we can split to no alert. Um, and if the deterioration is identified by um, intermittent monitoring, then that might be a neutral outcome. Um, if there's an alert, but the alert isn't early, then um, if the probability of the alert not being positive when viewed, that could be a false alert. If the alert is positive when viewed, then the alert can be true, but not useful because it wasn't early. Um, if the alert is significantly earlier than intermittent monitoring, though, uh, then, and it's positive when viewed, then it becomes a useful alert. Now, what you can see on the uh, right-hand column, there are a set of probability values that demonstrate that in this scenario, in fact, when we looked at this group of cardiac surgical patients, that based on heart rate, there was only the probability of picking up a heart rate alert um, was only 0.01. So if you put all this together, then um, if there were four false alerts for every true alert, if that was regarded as an acceptable level of alerting, of false alerting, if the value of the true alerts was enough to make that reasonable, then um, continuous heart rate monitoring would have been beneficial overall in the population where the probability of deterioration was around about 6%. But that probability of deterioration at 6% was about three times the actual probability of heart rate or saturation uh, deterioration as defined using the new score in this way in this, in this population of admittedly fairly stable recovering cardiac surgical populations. On the other hand, if the probability of achieving an outcome um, uh, better than intermittent observation would on only be, um, sorry, if at the other extreme, if 25% of the periods of deterioration uh, were there, then the potential for benefit would be much higher. So it crucially depends on how often or what the likelihood of deterioration is in this group. But narrowly, in this population, with the most technically robust system that was available to us for monitoring continuously heart rate and saturation, if you put together the coverage, the event rate, and when an alert would actually have made a difference, then in this environment, continuous monitoring, in fact, did not provide any value. And if you conceptualize it like this, uh, then you can see that it's only in a certain phase of a patient's progress that an alert has value. It clearly has alert if the patient is deteriorating, but if they're stable, abnormal, or recovering, it doesn't. And if they're normal and stable, then it's a false alert, and it arguably diverts resources and may even uh, deliver um, false or unnecessary intervention. So this set of studies uh, illustrates some of the complexities of continuous monitoring. Now admittedly, I'm showing you a very constrained view of the much wider problem because we're only looking at basic heart rate and saturation and of course you could argue you can do much cleverer things uh, if you uh, analyze this, fuse them, use various uh, clever um, database techniques, machine learning or whatever it might be, and we'll hear about that separately. We were also um, requiring from the monitoring package, the sensor package, the ability to provide continuous waveforms, which is a pretty high standard. You could well argue that you just don't need that. Uh, you only need a numeric for many um, situations. But the reason we wanted to do that was because 
this project had started out wanting to take a data fusion approach and still has that underneath it, and therefore we wanted the respiratory rate, which everyone believed is important, of course, um, and that required us to be able to derive it from these other biological signals. Um, and then there's the particular approach we've taken to defining deterioration in this context, which may not represent truly clinically important deterioration, but is used here to illustrate the complexities of uh, the analysis process. And of course, these results don't in any sense mean that continuous monitoring isn't useful. They just are designed to show that if you don't understand these potential complexities, and I've only taken one snippet, if you like, the sensor and data acquisition component around two simple signals, not the human factors before, not the infrastructural approach, because we tried to deal with that by using something that was robust, uh, nor anything downstream once you've got the data about how you might use it more intelligently, deploy it, and then the system-wide issues of your effect around. And as I say, there, um, but it, what it does do is illustrate some of the complexities. Um, there are other scenarios where this wouldn't be as problematic. And of course, trajectory mapping and exception reporting as opposed to simple deterioration may turn out to be just or even more important in the way we might use sensors to manage our patients. For instance, uh, one of my beliefs, prejudices, if you like, would be that if you had reliable monitors or sensor monitors that you could put on, uh, say, post-operative surgical patients, that actually, apart from an initial set of intermittent observations, if the blood pressure was normal, if the temperature was normal, that it's highly unlikely that you would need to take intermittent standard ward-based monitoring on these patients again during their stay, um, unless your continuous variables deteriorated. So, and if that were true and worked at scale, then of course it would potentially save a lot of nursing time. It might also, of course, have another set of problems because it might take away a clinical interaction that has soft value, um, the routine taking of observations, uh, where we don't understand the implication of taking that contact away. And as I say, even when we've got the data, then there may be much cleverer ways of using it. So, but what I wanted to share with you today, and I do apologize for whatever's going on with the cable connecting my iPad, uh, which usually works very well, um, is just that it's not safe merely to assume that <laughs> collecting two simple signals and handling them uh, continuously and just popping them into some sort of healthcare system or environment will automatically give you benefit. Not that it will work technically as well as people will tell you, nor that the insights it gained will necessarily be as clear cut as you think. So this is an area of great promise, but one that needs careful thought as we understand how to use and deploy these technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bill. Um, it seems that uh, we have a long way to go until a patient gets into the hospital and we stick one thing on, on the patient and we monitor everything and uh, absolutely monitoring well. So we have uh, time for one short question. If while people are thinking, I could just comment on your point. I mean, one of the dilemmas I always have when manufacturers come with a system and say, we can do this and it'll work, is having gone through this sort of exercise, one realizes, firstly, that things don't work as well as you're told necessarily and have rarely been tested as ri rigorously in the clinical environment as you might want. But even if they do, the question you always have to ask is, how will this piece of information add value? How will it change what we're going to do? How will the cost, monetary and otherwise, of putting it in place generate a return that um, makes it worthwhile? And those are quite challenging questions to ask at the moment, uh, to answer at the moment. Thank you, Professor Bill. And now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Dana Edelson, uh, our friend from American Heart Association. 
uh, and ask her to give a talk on um, machine-based learning approaches for prediction of clinical deterioration. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here and super fun city to be in. So this sounds like a super dry topic. I'd be, I'd be running right now that we're going to talk about machine learning. Let me see if I can make it a little bit not horrible. I actually think it's kind of awesome. I've spent the last decade of my life working in this space. So let me see if I can get you a little excited. Um, th these are my disclosures. Um, most significantly, I have IP around a predictive analytic e-cart that uses machine learning, which I'll reference. All right, so in order to set up this presentation, I have to tell you what I care about. And so I'm a hospitalist at the University of Chicago. I spend most of my time in that space. I'm actually really only interested in the patients that are really sick. Um, so that inner space where they sit between the floor and the ICU, that's my sweet spot. So I think about patients in the hospital as on, a, on, a, on the y-axis from healthy to dead and time during the hospitalization on the x-axis, and I think most patients come in like this. They're not quite at their healthy state. We get them better, they get discharged, they might even continue to get better after they get home. And I would say probably 95% of the patients that we see in the hospital, in fact, I know this from data, 95% of the patients do this. But 5% of them start on a slow and slippery trajectory downward, and if we don't catch them on that trajectory, some of them are gonna have a cardiac arrest. And at the point in which they have a cardiac arrest, we know that about 20% of them are gonna make it home and 80% of them are gonna die in the hospital. And that's a really big deal. On the other hand, if we can catch them earlier, we can make a huge difference. So the way we normally catch these patients is probably a little bit late. We recognize the deterioration, we move them to the ICU. The problem is every hour that we delay moving one of these patients to the ICU, their odds of mortality goes up by 3%. And again, we know this from lots of data. And so finding them earlier on that timeline is huge. It's where all the rapid response movement comes from. The idea of find them earlier, activate a team, get somebody to the bedside who can do something. The problem is we have to figure out how to find those patients and so that's where machine learning can really come into play. So most, probably the most common way that people identify these patients is with the modified early warning score. So how many folks are in a hospital that uses the, either the Muse or the News or some version like this? Show of hands. A lot, right? And, and where does the Muse come from? Does, it comes from our friends in the UK who were, who were well ahead of everybody else in this space, really saying, we need to figure out how to identify these patients and aggregated weighted score is gonna be a much more efficient way than the single parameter if their heart rate goes up or their respiratory rate goes up. Instead of having a, a list of if-then statements, they said, why don't we take a, take a bunch of these parameters, put them all together and add up a score. And it turns out that's really good. It's way, way better than the other, than the alternative. And they did this at a time when they didn't have, when there wasn't any data. And so a bunch of people sat around a table, really, really smart and gifted clinicians, and said, okay, what are the criteria that we're gonna put in? And what's the score, what's the weight that we're gonna attach to each of these different things? And if you add up all those different things, you get a score and then you can set thresholds, right? And that's awesome if you live in a world of paper charting. So show of hands, how many of you are in a hospital taking care of patients that is on a paper, that uses paper records right now? All right, now keep your hands up. How many of you are still gonna be on paper records in five years? Well, you're not moving, moving a lot over here, five years, yeah. But that's very, so I will still tell you, that's still a minority of people in this room that are using paper charts. The rest of us are all on electronic health records or will very soon be on electronic health records. So I know my hospital, for example, has been on electronic health record for a decade now. Lots of other hospitals have too. And the beauty of moving into the digital age now is we generate a ton of data. What data allows us to do is now develop 
analytics around it and, and to actually be able to learn from things that have happened instead of just using our, intu our clinical intuition. That is a major transformation that's really just happened, honestly, in the last decade for us in healthcare. Because before that, we didn't have the data to be able to make any of these decisions. We had to, we, we had to rely on our expert clinicians. And the beauty is now, we really don't, not in the same way that we did before. So, I, so the, the title that was given to me was machine learning for, for uh, identifying the critically ill. And so just to put it in the context, there are a lot of big words here that get thrown around, right? People talk about big data, and then there's artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and deep learning. And so let me just set it up a little bit so you know what I'm talking about. But basically, artificial intelligence is anything that enables computers to mimic human behavior. And the, the whole field of artificial intelligence really dates back to the 1950s. That's really when the, the term gets coined. And, and you don't actually need a lot of data for just basic AI. It's ma machine learning comes up in the 1980s once we, ha once we start to have large sums of data. Because um, the machine learning is actually a subset of AI that can learn from itself. That's what makes it machine learning. Then deep learning is a further subset of machine learning that now takes all that complex level of data and puts it into different layers, and then from those layers can then, can then learn. And so, again, all of this all falls under the umbrella, umbrella of artificial intelligence, but machine learning is that special subset, is the, su is the subset really in the middle of being able to learn from itself using large sums of data. So just to put it in context, here again is what, what we're talking about. So artificial intelligence, things like, um, if you remember the Deep Blue, the chess program that, uh, that, that beat Kasparov, that was, that was just simple artificial intelligence. Didn't learn from, from itself. Somebody wrote down all the code and then it was able to play without having access to a bunch of data and didn't need to learn from itself. Machine learning, is so you, you're probably interacting. Who who did a Google search this past week? Anybody searching Google? You're using machine learning, right? Every we're we're almost all interacting with machine learning in some way every single day. Um, and then deep learning now that's that's re that's really new. So. This is the kind of stuff that we're going to see take off more in healthcare. We're really not using it very much in healthcare at all. But that's, that's the stuff that's allowing us the Facebook spatial recognition. That's all deep learning. The driverless cars, deep learning. So it, we're already trying to figure out how we're going to use that better in healthcare. Um, but again, we're behind everyone else on this. And so with that context in mind, I'll say, all these, the, the rest of the world has been using the, has, has been using big data and big data analytics for a while. And so we look to them to see what are they doing and what can we borrow and, and take into healthcare. And so I was particularly impressed with Netflix. Netflix put out a, um, a challenge. They put a million dollars on the table and said, here's our data set of a bunch of movies that people have rented. And they said, they made it publicly available and said, We'll give a million dollars to the research team that, Im that does the best job of predicting based on, thi on this data set what movie someone's going to, if they've watched this one movie, what's the next movie they're going to see. Now, you'd think that's a crazy amount of money for something like that, but the truth is that's, that's their whole business. They make money by getting you to, when you finish one movie or a TV show, to watch another one right after. And so they live and die by those machine learning analytics that predict if you like this, what you're going to watch next. And so they had tons of different groups just submit different algorithms, and they, te and they had the actual data sets. So they're able to test it against to see which one wins. And it turns out that the winning algorithm was a machine learning algorithm called a random forest model. And so I'm going to show you a little bit about these. But back up to the idea that there are a bunch of different types of algorithms that, that constitute machine learning. So probably the most, the simplest that we think about, and, and the ones that many of us have used in our research, is just basic logistic regression. And so logistic regression basically classifies patients based on um, it draws a line 
on takes the data, forces it into a line, and says we predict that if you're that this you're more likely than not to die or not, whatever the outcome is. And so here's here's some of the limitations though that we run into. Here's Here's respiratory rate against the risk. So if risk on the y-axis, respiratory rate on the x-axis. You, you see that rest, and I'm going to show you this with actual hard data. This is just pretend. But imagine that this is what it looks like, right? Your risk goes up when your respiratory rate is low or when it's high. When you use a, a simple linear logistic regression, you force the data into a linear line. And so you end up... It, it ends up working well in the middle of the range, but struggles a little bit at both the low and the high end. And it's just an, an artifact of, have, of forcing the, this model to com comport to a linear term. And so then there are things that you can do to make that better. Instead of a lo linear logistic regression, you can do a cubic spline logistic regression, for example, which allows you to model the data this way. So instead of, um, you can put in different nodes and allow it to take a curvy linear shape which helps, and so all of these things make it better. Now, decision trees are another way to model data so different from regression analyses, and, and a basic regression decision tree and its fundamental form looks something like this. So if a patient's respiratory rate is greater than, we ask, is the, re is the respiratory rate greater than 20? If no, we say they're probably gonna survive. If yes, well, then we have to ask you, are, is the patient older than 65? So if their respiratory rate is high and they're older than 65, they're probably going to die, and otherwise they're probably going to sur survive. That's, that's just a very simple, at its core, tr tree. Now, so if you have, for example, a patient, a 38-year-old with a respiratory rate of 26, that patient would be predicted to survive just crude from this decision tree. Now a random forest model, which was the one that won in Netflix, for example, that one does something like this. It basically takes all your patient data and then takes a random sample of that data, what we call a bootstrap sample, and it creates trees. And each one of those trees uses a random sample of different predictors. And so you end up with thousands of individual trees instead of one, tons of them. And so then when you ask that same question, that 38-year-old woman or man with a respiratory rate of 26, some of those trees, some of those different trees, they'll be predicted to survive and some of them they'd be predicted to die. And overall you get a probability. So in this case, 20 2% of the trees, this patient would have died. And so it's a much better way of sampling the data than just making, forcing it all into one model and forcing a tree. So again, this is how they get more and more sophisticated. And then there are other models that build off of these. A lot of them tend to be tree-based, and these tree-based models tend to do really well. But then there are things like gradient-boosted machines, which, which oversample the, the patients that you, for example, misclassify end up getting oversampled in the learning model subsequently. So you just keep getting better and better at predicting the patients that you failed to predict correctly the one before. So, um, so inspired by the Netflix challenge, I said, well, I don't have a million dollars, but I, I do kudos and I do coffee and so I can put out this challenge to my research lab and we can do the same thing. I said, I got a big data set. Let's, f let's run a whole bunch of different models and let's figure out which one is the best one. So we did, we ran nine distinct models. We used a data set of about 270,000 patients with 33 longitudinal EHR variables. So a, ma a fairly massive data set for continuous throughout their whole hospitalization. We used all the routine labs, the vital signs and, uh, and some of the demographics. And this came from a sample of five different hospitals, which was a nice mix of urban academics, suburban teaching, and community non-teaching hospitals. And when we ran all those models, guess which one won? It was the same as, same as the um, Netflix. It, the random forest came in first, too. And so we, we end up, and this is a, the outcome for this study was a combination of cardiac arrest, ICU transfer, or death. 
It's different if you look at any of those individual outcomes by himself, but we were interested in the combined. And so we get an AUC of 0.8, which is pretty good. We can predict death with that same model with an AUC of about 0.94, which is almost economics level AUCs, pretty much unheard of in, in healthcare. But if you're looking at the combined of ICU transfer, cardiac arrest, or death, it comes out at about 0.8. The gradient boosted machine is almost identical in terms of predictive accuracy. And the MUSE is, is, is way, way at the bottom. They, you have to take my word for that, right? Because you think, what's the difference between an AUC of 0.8 and 0.7? Uh, the answer is a bunch of false alarms. That's the difference. In that data set, it was 50,000 fewer false alarms with a random force model over the MUSE. And this is, I'm from Chicago, this is guaranteed rate field where the White Sox play. That's, that's how many people are sitting in that. 50,000 is massive. And all those alarms, every time you fire false alarms, it's, it, has, it disincentivizes your, your, your nurses and everybody else who's responding to respond to the next one. So they're not, they're not just a waste of time, they're actually a waste of really critical energy that you need for the, for the next patient who's actually gonna be a true alarm. So one of the big problems, though, that people complain about in the machine learning, because they're, they're hands down, they're more predictive than anything else. But the thing that people complain about is that they can't see and touch the model in the way that they can with the other things. If I, if I have a regression model or a basic tree, I can publish it as is. I can put it right in the paper, and everybody can see it. They can touch the coefficients, and they can do it themselves without anything else. Well, that's, that doesn't work with machine learning learning models, right? Because the output is actually the entire data set on which it was derived. So the output is sitting on a computer. I can't publish it. I can't make it available at all. And, and so there are, other, there are ways where we can make it more accessible. And so one of the best ways to do that is with a variable importance plot. And so this is the variable importance plot from that model, that random forest model that I showed you. And it um, standardizes everything against the best predictor. And so hands down, no matter what model I use, and I, like I said, I've been at this for a decade, no matter how I cut it, respiratory rate is hands down the most predictive variable for whether a patient's gonna crump in the next eight hours. It just is. Followed by, by heart rate and then age. I always find the age thing to be fascinating that um, because, can we see this over and over again? And note that, that the UK, for example, in the original model and also in the, U the news, has left age out of the model. And I, I was confused about this at the time because I said, you know, maybe for the, the muse because people didn't know because they just made up the, the variables. But by the time they did the news, the news was done with data. They knew that age was predictive and they intentionally left it out. And they left it out for political reasons, just to not bias towards older patients, I assume because of this, the, uh, the national health care system, but I, it's fascinating to me. Um, all the vital signs end up being more predictive than, than the labs. Of the labs, this one, this one I had no idea. I was actually really surprised. BUN, hands down, the most predictive of all the labs, which is also pretty interesting. Again, if you look back at the literature around pancreatitis, for example, what BUN was stands out as predictive in that model. Turns out it's really predictive here too. Um, things like, um, uh, I also, well I should say oxygen saturation, not nearly as predictive as some of the other vital signs. But I can put this in and I can touch it and I can, and it feels like it makes sense to me. I can do other things like this. I can model risk against age. So here's, here's risk on the Y axis and age on the on the x-axis, and who saw this and is really upset? Show of hands. You should be. If you're on this side of 40, this is a terrifying graph, right? Whoever told you 40 is the new 20 is lying. It's not true. Statistically, that's just not true. Um, if you feel any better, 50 is definitely worse than 40, and 60 is definitely worse than 50. Um, the good news is that after 75, everything starts to even out, so there's good news coming, I guess. I'm still upset about this graph. And this is real, I didn't make this up. This is just the data talking. So, so this is age, 
Well, this is respiratory rate, which I already sort of showed you when theoretically was going to be the case, but this is the data actually talking. And so what's interesting here is you can see that in the 16, 18 to 20 and 20 range, the risk is low and anything lower than 16 is increases your risk and your risk really shoots up when you're over 25. So that's, uh, again, this is the data talking. But what's really interesting and what makes these machine learning models so cool is that they basically interact all the different variables against each other. And so now what I can do is show you what happens when I take respiratory rate and interact it with age. And that's just one of the interactions, but it looks something like this. So let me talk you through this. I've got respiratory rate over there, I've got age down there, and on the z-axis I've got risk. So here's how you interpret this. If you're breathing at 40 times a minute, you're toast. I don't care how old you are. That's just bad. If, on the other hand, you're breathing at eight a minute or six, it's really only a big deal if you're old. And that's what it looks like. That's a real interaction. And like I said, these interactions, you can imagine age, for example, interacts with everything. Certainly it interacts with heart rate, blood pressure, all of it. And some of the other things start to interact, and that's why these machine learning models are so much more powerful than the traditional um, simple AI that we were using before. And so, okay, well, so it's one thing to predict it, but now I gotta take it and actually use it, because otherwise it's just an exercise and, that, and, and a paper that I write and my mother and three other people read. Right, so in order for it to be of value, I actually have to deliver it to the bedside, put it in people's hands so they can actually do something with it. And so this is what it looks like. This is an example of eCart, our predictive algorithm, running inside an electronic health record right now. And you see it, you're inside a patient's chart, and you can see the trend graphed over time, and you can see what variables are, are driving it. So right now, at this particular moment, if you're able to see it, this patient is in the moderate risk, and you can see at that time then when we were looking at it, they, they had a one in 29 chance of going to the ICU, having a cardiac arrest, or dying in the next eight hours. And again, we're calculating real probabilities now, and so we can show that to people. And we can see that what's driving it was the oxygen saturation was low, and the patient was a little bit tachycardic. There's some other variables that are off too. The white count's a little high. Some of the other labs are off a little bit, but really, this is primarily driven by the fact that the patient's a little bit hypoxic. Okay, so that's me predicting it, but again, just predicting it isn't gonna save a patient's life. I, we can have the best predictive algorithms in the world. If we can't get people to do something different, it, they'll just know and let the patient die. And that's probably worse. They'd rather not do that, at least in the US where they might get sued. So, so what, now what we can do is say, all right, well, now this patient has an elevated risk and, and we can show them that we can give them a recommendation to click on a pathway. So now they click on that pathway over there, they're still inside that patient chart and now they're gonna run through a, an algorithm and they can assess the patient, they can see what happens to their eCart score and then they can, if the patient's still elevated, they can screen them for sepsis and if they screen positive for sepsis, they can order a lactate right there inside the pathway and we can track all that and feed that back to them. And that's without them having to go anywhere else. And so I'll, I'm gonna conclude with sort of the future of where I think we're going with all this and, and hold it up to, to driverless cars. So here's where we are as we think about driverless cars, right? I, we started from no automation at all. Everything was manual to, then we had some drive assistance. So your early cruise control was that just basic drive assistance. Then we had partial automation, which uh, most of us have now, where it's some little bit better, your, um, your cruise control now can, can adapt to how many cars are in front of you. There's the, the conditional automation now, which my car already has, which now I can, I can press a button and it will basically drive itself, keep it between the, between two lanes and it will stop and start depending on what the car is in front of me. But routinely it dings at me and says I need to put my hands back on the wheel because it lost a signal. 
in the future, and we're really not that far away from it, I don't believe these numbers um, that, that we're really five, ten years away, because we know we're seeing already full automation happening. It, it was, is, we're very close from never driving cars again, because it's just going to be easier to sit in the back seat and let the car drive for us. And that's both terrifying and amazing, because the truth is, it's going to be safer. Right now, it looks really scary, but we are, we are so dangerous out on the road, because we're humans and we do random things. And, and these machines, once they get really trained, they'll just be better at this sort of thing than we are. And that's probably true for healthcare. So where we are right now, it, what we, we are doing a lot of risk stratification. That's what people are doing, predicting who's going to deteriorate, predicting who's going to fall, predicting who needs to go home. That's all risk stratification. And it's really cool. And we're getting better and better and better at doing that. The next stuff that we really need to be working on, and that's just, so my research lab is working on version number next of this, which is, OK, once I know you're high risk, I need to know why. So is it because you're septic, or are you having a PE, or is this an MI? That's, that's figuring out, OK, well, what's the diagnosis based on once I know you're high risk or not? Once I know that, so, so I showed you those pathways that we have, well, right now those pathways are just expert, in, are expert guided in the same way that the original Muse was. We all sat around the table and said, I don't know, if they're septic, let's give them 30 cc's per kg of IV fluid. We made that up. We have no data. For, I mean, we have data that if we did that with a bundle of other things, people seemed to do better. But that 30 cc's per kg just came out of nowhere. That's not going to be the case. With all the data, we will know very soon not only how much, but which patients need fluid and which ones don't. Which ones it are, a lactate will be useful for and which ones it won't be. Um, and then if you imagine, once we can do that, we're probably not that far away from just running the fluid in automatically on our autonomous pumps. So think about it, again, terrifying and also really cool because think about the number of patients that we kill every year in sepsis because we missed it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Donna, for this inspiring talk. Do we have some questions from the comments from the audience? Please raise your hands. OK, we have in the middle over there the mic, please. This is Sam Parnia from NYU. Thank you, Donna. This was very, very exciting. Um, two quick questions. One is, are you reviewing the data that's now, are you reviewing the outcomes of these patients using the various algorithms to see how well the predictive scores are actually tying up with real uh, uh, events that occur to patients? And secondly, is this available for other people to use? Yeah, great question. So, so number one, Yes, we, it's, it's an actually complicated question. Are we evaluating how it works in real patients? So it's one thing we do the analyses with retrospective data, the derivation and the validation. Then we, before we actually did anything, we ran in black box, uh, but without, without intervening at all, so we could see how well it correlated prospectively. Once you actually turn it on and run it, you're running it as part of a whole complex system. And so you're no longer just testing the algorithm, but you're actually testing a whole bundle of care, which is, are people, is the algorithm correct? Are people using the algorithm? Once they look at it, are you driving them to the correct pathway? When they do that pathway, are they actually or clicking through and doing the things they need to? And then do the outcomes happen? But the answer is yes. So you know, one of the hospitals that, um, one of the early hospitals that ran, uh, ran the system, they did it, uh, they showed that they were able to bring their cardiac arrest rates down by uh, about 50%. They br and bring their ICU length of stay down by almost a full day. All, again, hard to tease out, though, how much of it is the algorithm itself versus putting a whole system through. And in the end, that, that's why I actually, I, I think the algorithms are amazing. I stand by them, and I love, I love it. And we, my research team geeks out on them constantly. We're constantly making it better and better. You'll see our deep learning model coming out really soon. It's very cool. 
on the other hand, I recognize that at some point we're just on the flat part of the curve, just getting a little bit of benefit in the AUC, and that the real magic happens with the whole getting people to the change management piece around it. And so the truth is, these days I spend most of my time trying to figure out how to do the, how to work the change management and how to make it easier and easier. So they just really, it's it like you really just can't do the wrong thing, and it's. It, it'll be harder for you to ignore it than to actually just do it. Um, and so the answer is, is it available? Yes, totally available. You can run this in Epic, Cerner, um, or with any EHR. You just have to have an EHR to be able to do it because it relies on electronic health records. So if anyone's interested in it, email me. I'm happy to talk to people about it. Thanks. So thank you, Nana. Thank you very much. So we have to move forward. Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, next uh, speaker, which is uh, Professor Professor Jerry Nolan, which is uh, pro honorary professor of resuscitation medicine at the University of Bristol, UK, and he's a consultant in uh, anesthesia and intensive care medicine in Bath, uh, UK. He's uh, the current chairman of ERC and uh, ex-chairman of uh, UK Research Council, uh, editor in chief of resuscitation and uh, he's going to be speaking on monitoring hospital level performance so let's see how how is the performance of the hospital marios thanks for that introduction i have to say don is a pretty tough act to follow but i will do my best in the time that i have um uh, that's my conflicts of interest i guess the main one is that i'm currently chair of the the uh, ncar steering group and what i'm going to discuss with you will involve quite a bit of um, in hospital registry work uh that's what i'm going to try and cover. I'm going to try and deal with the topic by, I guess, trying to understand what we can learn from some of the bigger in-hospital registries that are out there at the moment. There's quite a lot of data on that. And then as we go through this, I'll also look at some of the data we've got around um, into hospital variation on the management of patients post uh, ROSC as well. Um, uh, in, in terms of in-hospital registries, I guess the first really big one, and there may be others out there that preceded this, but certainly probably the big, and certainly the biggest to date, is the North American registry, uh, now called Get With Guidelines Resuscitation Registry, established in 2000, so it's been going for quite a long time now. And I think the, the, the important pit to pick up from that slide is the scope of this particular registry in North America when you compare it with certainly ours in the UK. So they're looking to get all individuals that receive chest compressions and or defibrillation. So very short, very clear scope. They're trying to capture pretty well all cardiac arrests. Now that differs from another in-hospital cardiac arrest registry, which is the UK one. It's, it's a much younger registry. It's been going since 2009. Um, but I would say that it, it covers a lot more of our National Health Service and certainly something like 90% of the hospitals in England, for example, are sending data in now to this. But if you look very closely at the scope, the key thing is, is that this is really an audit of the performance of our in-hospital resuscitation team. And so we're only collecting those cardiac arrests for which there is a, a, a 222 call, which, are st which is the standardized in-hospital call in the UK. So it's a different scope. And just to give you an idea of numbers here, you can see just from the last few years, if you look at the reported in-hospital cardiac arrest, we're probably running at about 16,000 a year. I try to kind of match that up with the North American registry, and it's pretty similar. I think they're collecting fairly similar numbers each year now in their registry, although it's hard to get down to the absolute detail. And just to give you an idea, once you've got a huge registry like that, um, you can look, for example, at your incidence of cardiac arrest per thousand admissions. Uh, and if you track that over the time we've been running with a standardized scope from 2012, you can see clearly it is slowly falling away. Why it is, I can't tell you. But it's certainly uh, reducing over time. Now, just to introduce to you the importance, if, if, if we're going to look at comparing hospital level performance, which is politically really sensitive. When you're comparing the performance of one hospital with another, people get really nervous about doing that, and they're gonna be very unhappy to do that unless we're very, very clear we're comparing apples with apples, not apples with oranges. And the only way you can do that is by having a pretty good 
risk adjustment model so that we can adjust for differences in case mix between the different hospitals, which are inevitable for reasons which we'll come to as we go through. So this was the um, case mix model that was created from the uh, Get With The Guidelines Registry, and they, they ended up looking at a whole number of things, because I should point out that the, the American Get With The Guidelines Registry includes many, many more data, data points than we have in the UK. So ours is a much sim simpler sort of core model. So they've got more things they can look at. They came down eventually to nine variables in their final model. So nine things that were sort of most predictive of outcome in these patients. And they've got a C index, and, and you know, you, you've heard a lot of statistics in this, in this uh, meeting. C index is the concordance index. The closer to one you get, the better. One is the kind of perfect, you know, you would predict every single person that was either going to survive or die. Obviously, no models will do that, but the nearer one, the better. And you can see theirs is 0.74. And I'm highlighting that for reasons we'll come to in a moment. Uh, just to give you a kind of flavor of the things that go in there, and I know this is lots and lots of numbers, but don't worry. So, for example, if you look at age, uh, and I guess that ties in quite nicely with what Dana's just been saying. Um, um, I'm getting towards it, but not quite there yet. Uh, significantly bad, obviously. So, half there in terms of uh, survival rate. And of course, what we know down here, if you've got a, a shock or rhythm, you've got a much higher chance of survival. None of that's surprising. It's just giving you an idea of the things that go in there. But again, if we look at um, a hospital location, if you're in a surgical procedural area, much higher chance of survival. But if you've got uh, some sort of malignancy, no surprises, much worse off. And so you can see how you can sort of build all those things into the, into the model. And then by doing that, you can then look at this, is this top graph here shows you all the hospitals, and this is the N for all the number of hospitals, and this is the unadjusted survival rate, so huge range in overall survival to discharge after in-hospital cardiac arrest in this American data set. But you can see very nicely from that slide the effect of applying that risk adjustment model, because now you knock out all these outliers, you bunch together all these things, so in theory, you are now comparing apples with apples across this slide. Of course, it still leaves you, interestingly, with marked variation in survival rates despite apparent adjustment. And that's the bit that should interest us because we need to understand why that is. Again, if we look at the, uh, the North American data, we've looked at their uh, hospital cardiac incidence rate. Remember I showed you ours is about, I think, 1.2 or something at the moment. Median for all of these hospitals is around four, but huge variation in the incidence of cardiac arrest, apparent incidence of cardiac arrest, treated cardiac arrest, I should say. And the reason I've emphasized this is that if you look very closely here, this is uh, one of the first really interesting, I think, statistics that come out of all this work. If you look at the adjusted cardiac arrest incidence rate, the higher the incidence, the more cardiac arrests in a hospital, then you start to see reducing survival rate. And of course, there could be a number of reasons for that. The most obvious one would be variation in an application of a do not attempt resuscitation order. So of course, if you start applying that appropriately and effectively, you will be making far fewer resuscitation attempts in people that really have no chance of survival. And that might be a factor that comes into that. That hasn't been shown, but that's obvious as it could be. So this is the UK model that was led by David Harrison, who's a statistician that works uh, for us with us and you can see it's simpler in that there are fewer variables in that model largely because we don't have a lot of the comorbidity data that the North American set has um, but we've got we've included things slightly differently so again linking perhaps with Dana's talk is that we have a situation of course where we might have a, a, a 2222 call um, peri arrest before the patient arrests so that if the patient then goes on to have a cardiac arrest that a team is already there and so we're able to build that factor into our model. And what I find really interesting, and I find it hard to understand, and David Harrison has not really been able to, uh, to explain it to me, is why we end up with a C index, which is actually higher than the North American one, with, with a much simpler core data set. We have no comorbidity stuff in here at all. So, and I don't know why that is, unless it's to do with that, that we're back, so if I just go back, unless it is to do with the power of this one here. So if we look at that and we apply our risk adjustment, and this is how we're using it, and I haven't seen similar 
um, data from, from the, the North American set. This is what gets fed back to individual hospitals in the United Kingdom, the UK NCAR. And um, you've got this kind of funnel plot here. You've got the number of, so you can see the number of cardiac arrests each year in individual hospitals, and each one of those dots is an individual hospital. And this is now looking at the ratio of the observed to expected survival to discharge. So if your performance is pretty well average compared with all the other hospitals in the United Kingdom, then you'll be running, your, your observed rate should be pretty well exactly um, the actual rate. So, sorry, the predicted rate. Uh, and if you look uh, here, because this is obviously, no surprises for guessing this comes from my own hospital, and somewhere up here, kind of there, I think, is that red? I'm colorblind, so you have to forgive me for not being able to spot that. So I know where my hospital is up there, so I can compare the performance of my hospital with all the others. But of course, the others at the moment remain anonymized. In the future, and this is a whole other debate which I'm not going to go into, it may well be that they are de-anonymized, and the whole thing is then completely public and transparent reporting. That will come, but it's not there yet. And if you can see these lines here, that's two standard deviations, three standard deviations. And certainly once you start looking at some of these, you know, why is it that some of these hospitals are doing very, very well beyond three standard deviations and some of them doing very, very poorly? And we have to look into that to understand that. And then this is just, again, using the same sort of data. You can track what's going on in terms of time, trend for your own particular hospital, and then match that. So this is uh, my hospital here, the trend in this adjusted uh, ratio compared with the national data set, which is the blue dotted line there. And those are the, that's the 95% um, confidence interval in the gray. So we can start to track and see, are we getting progressively better, worse, et cetera? It gives us a lot of information. Um, we've got some of the data, obviously, and this is now flipping back to the, to the North American data set. And again, looking at trends in what's going on in terms of survival to discharge. Again, looking at variation in hospitals as well. And you can see just comparing 2000 to 2003, with later years there. It's quite a nice graphical way showing you all, these are all N hospitals with their survival rates. Clearly, you can see that right shift, that improvement in survival to hospital discharge. And these are adjusted data, so it's adjusted for case mix. So in theory, it should be real. Um, I'm gonna skip that for the sake of time because I'm conscious we wanna leave a bit of time at the end. I think this is an important study. It's an example of what can be done with these registries. If you combine the registry, so all the routine you collected data from all these hospitals, and then you put out, for example, a survey to those hospitals, asking all sorts of questions about the kind of things that they do in their hospital in terms of interventions, but, and a whole lot of other things that I'll show you in a minute. It is possible then to link up practices in hospital with the impact on survival rates after cardiac arrest. And this is the study using the American data set. And you can see there are actually just three things here that in fact impacted on survival rate once you'd adjusted for case mix. One of those was actually the frequency of review of in-hospital cardiac arrests. So those hospitals doing it more frequently than quarterly were performing better. Monitoring for interrupted chest compressions. And in case you're wondering how was that actually done, it's not clear, it's in the questionnaire. I suggest if you want to look at this in detail, and it is worth looking at closely, go and have a look. And in the online supplement, their detailed questionnaire is there. As you can see the questions they are asking about what was going on in any given hospital for this. But it's one of the few examples where I've seen uh, some associate, strong association between monitoring CPR performance and actual survival rates. It's not, there's not a lot out there on that. And then this bottom one there is around adequate resuscitation training. Of course, that's a pretty subjective question to ask people. But nonetheless, there seems to be a linkage with that and or an association between that and outcome. Lots of things weren't, and I've just put a few of those things there. Disappointingly, perhaps, immediate code debriefing, for example, I know this is a subject close to, to Dana's heart, did, was not associated with um, a change in survival rates. And if you combine uh, those hospitals that had one, two, or all three of those best practices that were associated with, with survival rates, we can see there the risk standardized survival rates going up and up and up. So it's really quite powerful information we can get from that. 
What about nursing staff levels and work environments? This again is quite interesting, especially for the nurses amongst the audience, and I suspect. It's the only evidence I've seen of a really close association between sort of numbers of nurses and, and survival rates. Again, we get with the uh, guidelines registry, combining again with a survey, as you can see here, very large survey of all the nursing staff. And what they did included in that survey was this sort of nursing work index, something which I don't know in detail, but you can go and read about if you want to. It's to do with all sorts of measures of uh, the nursing, the work nursing environment. And you can see, obviously, um, interesting in terms of their data um, for ICU staff, and for example, uh, less than two patients per nurse and, and only a third of them. So in the UK, that would be a much higher proportion in our ICUs. And you've got the ward staffing arrangements over there just to give you some idea of what's going on. So again, in around a fifth or so of these, less than five patients per nurse. Of course, it largely depends on how you define a nurse, but I suspect our nursing levels in the UK are substantially less than that. What they're able to show with this is, if you look closely here, is um, the number of ICU nurses seem to have no impact uh, on survival to discharge, the survival to discharge rate. But when you start looking at the, the medical and surgical wards, there is a significant effect here on survival rates. And the take home, I've tried to summarize that in that box there. For each additional patient per nurse on the wards, you had a reduction in survival rate of 5% after in hospital cardiac arrest. So quite interesting data linking directly with nurses. And if you look at their um, working environments based on that questionnaire that I've just described, um, you can see a 16% reduction uh, in survival rates for those that are in the worst working environments. So interesting stuff. Similarly, you can look at other processes of care. And here we've got some guideline recommended for processes of care, again, using the, the North American data. And there's just five elements that they chose here to reflect important practice in terms of its effect on outcome. So, so monitoring correct uh, trachea tube placement, whether the arrest was witnessed or not, time to first compression less than a minute, time to defibrillation less than two, and then administration of a vasopressor in less than five. So those were the five things. I'm only briefly sure this is a huge amount, but just to show you, if you just take the top one up here, you get an idea. So that's the overall, all the hospitals. So in terms of um, confirming placement of trachea tube, 85% overall, but quite a marked range between the poorest performing hospital and the highest performing one at the end, which I can just see at the end. And the same applies to all those other things. And if you combine all that together, you can end up here and then obviously adjusting the data, as you can see over there, effectively for each 10% increase in a hospital's um, performance score, and those scores are derived from all those elements, it was associated with a 22% increase. And just have a look at that 1.22 over here, 20% increase in, in odds of survival. So you can show directly linkage with some of these interventions and practices with survival rates. Some of you may remember this, which was quite well um, publicized at the time, a very clever study using that American registry again, looking um, at the duration of CPR attempt and survival rates and its variation between different hospitals. And I think the really clever thing about this, and it's, it's quite difficult to explain the study, but what they did was they looked at the duration of CPR in non-survivors as a kind of indicator of how hard the resuscitation teams in these hospitals were trying to resuscitate people. I hope that kind of makes sense. And you can see just overall down here, the median duration of, of, of CPR in the survivors, those are choosing ROS, was about 12 minutes. But it's the non-survivors were most interested in. The median value was about 20 minutes. And what you can see here is, is quite marked variation in terms of duration of resuscitation attempt. These are all non-survivors in this graph that don't survive. And then, and it's trying to get this message across in a very short time, if you divide those, um, all those hospitals with duration of CPR in non-survivors, put them into quartile, 16, 19, 22, and 25 minutes, those in the highest quartile, so trying the hardest, you might say, in people that don't eventually survive, if you actually look at their survival rate, so in turn look at the people that do survive, they have a significantly higher um, a 
suggest sort of case meets the justice survival rate for most hospitals. So message, it implies that if they're trying harder with their CPR attempts, they are actually getting somewhere and ending up with more survivors. I hope you understood that because it's quite a complex study. The same data has looked at it from a slightly different way. What they've done here is taken it, and the, again, the focus is on non-survivors here. But interesting, what you can do is look at predictive scores, scores that predict outcome after a cardiac arrest. And one of those scores is called the GOFAR score here, and it uses 13 different pre-arrest characteristics. And it can look at the predicting of the chance of that, of that individual surviving. And you can divide it down here between very low chance, less than 1%, or the up to a fairly high chance, 15% at least, or more than 15% chance of survival. These are all non-survivors. I keep trying to emphasize that because it, it's pretty confusing otherwise. But you can see clearly a relationship between those people, patients, that are predicted to have a higher chance of survival even though they don't survive, have longer durations of cardiac arrest. Okay, so that's the first message. Hopefully you've got that bit, and then you have a chance of understanding the next bit. And that is when you look here, again, using these chances of survival, all of these patients are not survivors, but what is quite worrying is the end group there. Because about 30% of this group here, despite the fact they have higher than average chances of survival, get a lower than average duration of their resuscitation attempt. All of these are less than 19 minutes. Despite the fact, at least according to those predictors, they would have had a decent chance. So, and of course, there's all sorts of variation going across in those hospitals, and we have to ask why. So interesting, stimulating data. I'm gonna whiz through, I think I'm actually gonna skip that one because of time, I don't wanna overrun this. And I just want to look very quickly at some of the um, hospital performance um, characteristics we've got for the management of patients that have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and then get them in into hospital. And this ties in and overlaps fairly well with the whole question of cardiac arrest centers, of course. And so this was a study, it was a sub-analysis of the Rock Primer study, so a big North American study, quite a large data set, as you can see over there, about 3,000 patients. And they were looking at five so-called ill-core-guided recommended therapies. Um, that, that, that may or may not be provided in those hospitals. And they, they are listed down there. They either relate to andrography, I think three of them relate to the use of TTM, its duration, et cetera. And the other one relates to um, withdrawal of life support or life-sustaining therapies um, before day three, unless the patient is brain dead. So there was those five things there. And if you look, you can derive then composite scores. So in other words, working out um, whether these hospitals meet those criteria or not for all those patients that are admitted in after after out of hospital cardiac arrest. And you can see here, these are just the number of hospitals, and there's a huge variation in that performance score. So a huge variation in the application of those interventions in those, in those hospitals. And if you look over here, and just try and, because there's a lot of data on here, just focus on all rhythms, because I'm not going to look at the separate ones here. If you look at the all rhythms, you've got the survival rates, which will be up here in the darker blue, and then survival neurologically attacks in the, in the light blue there. And you can clearly see, and that's the p-value there, the relationship between the more and more of the higher and higher your composite performance score, the more of those interventions you're applying, the higher your survival rates. And those are all adjusted data. So they're all case mix adjusted. So in theory, it should be true. So that suggests that there is a relationship between hospital performance and outcome after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But then counter that with this study that's fairly recent from Paris that seemed to, to not show that. And this was just looking at the greater Paris area here. They divided there, I think it's like 48 hospitals altogether. And they were split between whether they were high case volume and they had a 24-7 cath lab. So you might say maybe equivalent of a cardiac arrest center whether they were intermediate and just had cath lab that was not available 24-7, but existed, and then low case volume, no cath lab at all. And you can see just very quickly here, between A, B, and C, that the unadjusted data, so if you just look at survival rates without any case mix adjustment, they clearly do much better in these cardiac, so-called cardiac arrest centers. So everybody says, well, that's clearly evidence that these centers must be better. But in fact, 
when you case, mix, adjust it, and these are all the different things that they were putting into their model to, to adjust. You can see down the bottom here, if you look, these all cross one, these confidence intervals here, there is no significant difference in, in outcome um, following admission to any of those types of hospitals. So completely contradictory data. Okay, so bang on 10 o'clock, I will summarize. Um, I think the in-hospital registries can provide us with incredibly valuable data. And when it comes to hospital performance, as long as we can reliably risk adjust that data, I think it's reasonable to compare performance between hospitals. We can certainly look at guideline recommended practices and see how they impact on the survival rates in those hospitals. As far as hospital variation and the management of patients after out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, I think the data are less clear, and of course there are some ongo ongoing randomized controlled trials. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jerry, for being exactly on time. Uh, one question, if there is any. It seems that there are a lot of um, a lot of things that and variables and parameters to predict or uh, predict survival uh, of cardiac arrest. It's a long way to go, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure, and it may be that there is a little bit of overlap with what Dana was saying, because of course all these rely on these huge data sets. And I think if we can get much, much better at, at, at evening out diff case mix effects, then I think we have a chance of having a really reliable tool to look at hospital performance. Okay, thank you everybody for participating. Thank you to all the speakers. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.